Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. Some announcements. Consistory will be meeting not today, but next Sunday after worship. If you haven't done so already, we're going to keep pushing this to remind everyone our 150th anniversary celebration of St. Paul's is coming up on October the 29th. Still, if you know somebody uh, that you want to have as invitation, please let me or Sarah know or the office. Um, we've sent out, you probably already received them, you are saved the dates, and we'll be sending out the invitations in a week or uh, towards the end of the month for the actual date. Great. Um, next Saturday from 5 to 7, we will be having our annual steak roast. It will be a special gala event. It will be a traditional, pure Detroit dinner. You will get to experience what Rippling Hope's volunteers have experienced uh, throughout the summer. And we'll also be dedicating the Peace Bowl that day. Sarah, you have an announcement? Well, actually, I have two. Uh, first of all, I wanted to bring to your attention the bulletin board out in the hallway, which is talking about reconciliation. Now, reconciliation can mean a lot of things, but to the disciples of Christ, this mission is specifically about uh, race relations. And um, in the flyer that comes out, it mentions how the last donations were used. In March of 2022, your generous giving to the Reconciliation Ministry, which will be coming up at the end of September and the 1st of October this year, your generous giving to the Reconciliation Ministry helped fund the Kirkpatrick Lecture Series of the Disciples of Christ Historical Society. Over 250 people were able to participate at the conference and most received generous support to be in attendance virtually or in person. So I'm thinking this is something you should look at this year when they do the conference. Uh, we should fund people who would like to attend, either virtually or in person. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to this. There is a big old bulletin board that Nan did for us, and it explains a little bit more uh, about race relations. And I really like the poster that Nina got for us, which says, uh, Black Lives Matter that doesn't mean that only black lives matter, all lives matter. And it went on to say that this is important. It's also important uh, that we consider all of our race relations, which is a difficult and touchy subject. Uh, and that's what reconciliation ministry is all about, dealing with a difficult subject. Secondly, um, I belong to an organization that is very, very focused on literacy. And it's called the American Association of University Women. Uh, everyone can join should they want to, men and women, people with uh, university degrees or not. Uh, but this year, as uh, we have not in the past couple of years, we will be having a uh, used book sale. The reason I'm bringing this up is because A, we will have an ad there because you may not know that St. Paul sponsors this. Uh, we are one of the 10 sponsors uh, who have signed up to donate. Um, the other thing I wanted to say thank you for and hope that you continue is the generous donation of really gorgeous used books. Thank you very much. Any other announcements? 
Then let us stand and sing. Join me in the call to worship. When we try to hide, God, God always finds us. When we crawl into the darkness, even, even there, there we don't escape God. God's eyes. Are you tired of running from the one who loves you? We are here at last, ready and eager to be made whole. Let us worship the living God. Please join me in the invocation. O oh Lord, Lord, you are the potter, and we are the clay. Take our lives, O God, and remake us anew. Pour your Spirit upon us, that we may be filled with living water. Fit for your purposes, that we may be wholly yours. Amen. The first scripture reading for today is Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, Come, go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I may will pluck up and will break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken, turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And another moment, I might declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant, plant it, but if it does evil in my sight and not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do to it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil ways and amend your ways and your doings. 
The second reading is Psalm 139, 1 through 6, and 13 through 18. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I may know very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven from the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my uninformed, my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that formed for me. When none of them is when none of them had yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I will come to the end. I am still with you. And our gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost, to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks, asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? <clears throat> this is the word of the Lord, for we, the people of the Lord. So, like many people who are in ministry, I experienced what is called a call to ministry at none other than church camp. A little plug for church camp. How many of you went to church camp, even if it was way back when? Church camp is a wonderful place. It is a place that has formed church camps all over the country, have formed so many lives, and in, informed so many people of faith. Now, it was in the summer of 1972 at high school church camp conference that I had an experience. I won't describe the whole experience because it was rather intense and it makes me emotional even now when I think about it. <clears throat> but it was an experience and that experience was in large part informed, I think, <coughs> because during our conference that summer, we were reading a book by Charles Sheldon called In His Steps. Is that a book any of you have ever read? Very good. I knew LaRue would have read it because it's a classic disciple. <laughs> Yay, disciples. Um, but we had studied and read that book, and it was, a, it was a powerful book and a powerful experience to be there with friends and do all the things we do at church camp. Horse around, spy on the girls' cabins. <laughs> oh boy. Exactly. Um, and all those other wonderful things. Sing songs, play in the river, get into trouble. Just lots and lots of fun. But something happened on the very last night of that conference that year that we were all invited after our worship service to go out and spend some time in quiet 
meditation, reflecting on what we had learned and experienced that week and how it might affect our lives as we were going home the next day. So I remember sitting out in a place on the back porch of one of the buildings and something came over me. I can't describe it even to this day. I didn't know what it was. I was perplexed. And I left the next day with that feeling still in my heart and almost weighing heavily on me. I went home and I began to talk to my parents about it and they had not a clue about what I was saying. So I sought out the advice of some clergy friends and we talked and over several days and conversations and finally it became clear to me, or not so clear to me, but clear to those I was talking to, that in fact I had experienced what we call a call to ministry. I wasn't sure what that meant, but sometime in September of 1972, my senior year of high school, I remember walking down the aisle at the end of the service, the end of our worship service, walking down where my pastor greeted me, and I publicly declared my intention to pursue a life and a career in ministry. And so here I am today. And then, as many folks during their senior year, and some these days, much earlier in their high school career, I had to figure out where I was going to go to college to pursue that call I had received. Now, as a disciple of Christ, I looked at Disciples of Christ schools, like Culver Stockton in Missouri, which was close to me, and Eureka College, which it was also close to my home town of St. Louis. And both of those schools were small schools that had football teams, and I thought, well, maybe I could go there and play football in college. That would be fun. Or I looked at Phillips University in Oklahoma, a good school. But really, I thought, do I really want to go to Oklahoma? <laughs> and then, TCU came onto my radar screen. Notice the shirt I'm wearing today? <laughs> TCU is in Texas, Texas Christian University. It was a long ways. In fact, it's 660 miles from my childhood home to Fort Worth, Texas, where TCU was located. But I had a friend from my own church youth group who had left the year before and gone to TCU. So I knew something of the school. There was something about TCU that attracted me. So I thought this is the place I should go. So I did all the stuff that seniors do when they're getting ready for college. And I did the application. And one day the letter arrived that said I had been accepted. And I can't tell you how excited I was. <laughs> My parents and I went to freshman orientation that summer. It was an interesting experience being at freshman orientation with a whole bunch of people that I didn't know and who talked kind of funny. Because <laughs> most of them were from Texas. And I was just a good old boy from St. Louis, Missouri. Charlie, do we St. Louisans have an accent? But it's not like a Texas accent. <laughs> I remember, though, during that freshman orientation, sitting in the room that I was staying in for those couple of nights and thinking to myself, what the hell have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Going 660 miles from home, knowing one person in this place, and planning to study to be a minister? What was I thinking? But in August, off my parents and I went back to Fort Worth, Texas. Now those turned out to be some of the best four years of my life, my time spent there. I graduated, finally, from TCU, and I was supposed to be off to seminary the next year. That You see, that's the normal path that ministers take. You go to college, you graduate, then you go right to seminary, and then you're off to serving church somewhere. But something, when I was approaching my graduation from TCU, didn't feel right to me. I felt unsettled. I realized that I was sick of school 
after 16 straight years. And so I graduated, I went home, and I sat down with my parents. And I said, Mom and Dad, I'm not ready to go to seminary right now. I am sick of school and I need to do something else. But I don't have any idea what it was. I remember the conversation like it was just yesterday. Sitting not in our family room, not at the kitchen table, but in the living room. Yeah. So it was a serious conversation. And I remember my dad saying, well, son, what are you planning to do? Your mom and I are concerned about you and your future. You said you planned to be a minister, and now what are you going to do? I was able to muster the courage and say, I don't really know, Dad. I plan on becoming a minister, but I just need some time. I'm sick of school, and I need to do something else for a while. Then Dad said, well, son, you can live with us for four weeks here in this house. You can even have your old room back for four weeks. But during that four weeks, we expect you to get a job and figure out what you're going to do now. And he threw in these words of advice. I know you probably think that people are going to come knocking at the door or calling because you just graduated from college with some wonderful job offer for you. But son, nobody's coming and nobody's calling. So you better get to work finding a job. And I knew he was serious. I knew that four weeks was going to go by fast and I better get to work. So I started looking for jobs. In week two of my search, I found Prosser's Moving and Storage, an Allied Band Lines, Allied Band Lines agent in St. Louis. They were looking for movers. I went and I applied and I was hired on the spot strapping young man. <laughs> they needed strapping young men to move your household furniture from place to place. I started the next Monday moving furniture, people's and businesses stuff, working eight to 14 hour days, often six days a week, and making the whopping sum of $2.25 an hour. Now remember, this was in 1977. I liked the work, though, and I loved the guys I worked with. Some were my age and some a bit older, who had similar stories as mine. College graduates trying to figure out what to do with life ended up at Crossers Moving and Storage. And then there were some like Charlie and Dan and Jean who were in their 50s and 60s and had been at that work all of their lives. As the youngest guy on the crew, I was made fun of a lot, and I got to do, as often happens, as the new guy, I got to do all of the worst jobs. Now, one of the expectations of the job was that everyone who worked for Prossers could drive one of the trucks if needed. All of our trucks had stick shifts. I had grown up in a family where my dad thought stick shifts were awful. So we never had one. So I hadn't a clue how to drive a stick shift. Never driven one in my life. One day, one of the old guys said, Carl, you have to learn how to drive one if you want to get ahead in this business, or you might even lose your job. I said, I don't know how. And he said, well, today you're going to learn. We headed out on a job in one of our box trucks, and he pulled over suddenly on a hill. And he said, Carl, it's time for you to learn. <laughs> oh my. I fretted, I stewed, I tried. I was shifting gears. I was trying to make the clutch work and the gears engage and have my foot at just the right amount on the gas pedal to make everything work the way I thought it was supposed to. And I kept thinking, what in the world have I got myself into? Just the right amount of clutch and gas, and there we sat. In fact, I kept creeping backwards down the hill. And I finally said, I can't do this. I guess I'll just get fired. 
And he said, my mentor said, Carl, you can do it. You have a college degree. How hard can it be? <laughs> and suddenly the gears caught, the truck moved forward, I pulled out of the space, and we went on to get a small load from someone's home. And I drove the truck to the next destination and back to the yard, to our warehouse. A great success. And guess what? A year later, just one year later, I was driving a semi, driving cross country, moving people. And I did that for the next six years. And yet, I will tell you, there was more than that on more than one occasion, I still found myself asking the question, what have I gotten myself into? Like when I was driving through Manhattan in a semi, trying to find the Steinway Piano Factory to pick up a grand piano to deliver to somebody in Indiana. Or when I was sitting on top of an icy snow pass, trying to figure out how am I going to get to the bottom in one piece? Or more importantly, with the truck in one piece. <laughs> Just trying to figure out how to get all of your stuff into my truck so that you can be moved in one load instead of two. What does all this have to do with us as people of faith? It has everything to do with us, my friends. For the road is not easy. The path is not simple. We know the road is hard and there are twists and turns. There are hills and valleys. There are bumps and even craters in the road. Are we ready? Are we prepared? Can we make it? As my old friend said to me when he parked the truck on that hill for me to learn how to drive that stick ship, you can do it, Carl. So can we do it. We can get the gas and the clutch to work together and go forward and not slip backward. We can do it. We can move forward as people of faith. We can be the people God calls us to be. We can be God's people of faith. But scripture tells us there is a cost. There is a cost to life such as this, as God's people, as Jesus' followers. When I went through the pastor's class as a fourth grader, which was the tradition and still is among many disciples of Christ's congregation, or confirmation class, as you practice in the United Church of Christ congregation, I didn't understand much of what the pastor or the teacher of the class was saying most of the time. I really don't think I understood what they were saying about the kind of life we were to live when we followed Jesus and made a decision and a commitment to follow him that would lead us to baptism. And I'm not sure what they said, except that what we were supposed to do is to follow Jesus' sayings and his teachings and follow his ways. But I'm pretty sure that they didn't talk much about the consequences of following him and what those might be. That there would be risks and challenges and difficult times. And that the way would not always be easy to be a follower of Jesus. You see, folks, there is a cost to following the way of Jesus. In today's gospel, he reminds us that we should and must count the cost before committing to life as his followers. Life as followers of the Christ is not an easy path. His first disciples and followers found that out the hard way. It was not a popular path. There was torture. There was persecution. Even death. For many who publicly followed his way. There was a commitment involved and that commitment often led to the giving of one's own life for his cause, for the way that he set before us. The way of Jesus is not some utopian pie in the sky by and by. It's not some everything's magically going to be all right. There is a cost to following him. This one we have known and called the Christ down through the ages. And it's not going to be easy. There is a price to pay. But here is some good news, friends. Today, just like every day, the good news is that the one who calls us to follow is our God. Our almighty, loving, great, and gracious God. 
And this same God not only calls us to follow, but empowers and enables us along the way. You see, God knows the way is difficult. The path is filled with hills and valleys. There are stumbling blocks along the way. And so the prophet Jeremiah gives us an image of God as a potter, always working with the clay, with us, to fashion something new and beautiful. Have you ever had the opportunity to watch a potter at work? It's amazing to watch them. I'm fascinated. A person with great patience and vision. I will admit, I don't think I could ever be a potter. I don't have nearly the patience it takes. A potter can sit at their potter's wheel for hours, working, fashioning, creating, until the piece they are working on is just right. As we watch the potter working, we might think that the mug, the plate, the chalice <clears throat> that they're working on looks pretty good. And then suddenly, this magnificent looking to us creation, the potter just takes in their hand and mashes it all back together because it's not quite what they envisioned. They want to make it just right. And so they start all over again to turn it into the beautiful creation that he or she envisioned. Such is the nature of our God, always calling, always casting a vision of a beautiful creation, always making, molding, shaping us into the people we are created to be, and never leaving us alone. Yes, as people of faith, as those who are called and claimed as followers of the Christ, there will be plenty of days when we want to throw up our hands and say, what have I gotten myself into as followers of Jesus? The way just seems just way too hard, the path too difficult. I'd rather not go that way. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. But remember, friends, just like when I was sitting on the hill on the street in St. Louis, trying to figure out how to make the clutch and the gas work together so I could move forward, we have one with us who, like my old mentor, says to us all the time, you can do it. You can make it work. You can make this truck move down the street. Just be patient and keep trying. God is surely with us, calling us to follow, calling us to be, always working with us to shape and reshape us into the image we are created to be. May you be blessed upon your journey. May you stay safe, strong, and of good courage in the living and facing of these days. And may you go with God as God surely goes with you. Let us stand and sing our doxology. <laughs> together. Thank you, God, for your many blessings to us. Accept now our tithes and offerings, and use us and our gifts for your kingdom. Amen. Please be seated. Do I have any other prayer requests? Do we have cards on, are they on the back table back there? Yes. Okay. Um, cards for... Um, to let people know that we're thinking about them, um, how they're doing and everything else. So check them, look at them, and leave a message. <laughs> it's stuck. Would you glue it in there? Yeah, Come really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs>
Bert, is that Bert or Bart? Bert? Bert. Bertram Howard. Okay. Um, is back, uh, back home recovering from knee surgery. And that is always fun. Sean's birthday was September 1st. Yay, Yay Sean. Sean. We're singing happy birthday. Yeah. Yes, of course. <coughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Sean. Happy birthday to you. Um, and pray for safe, tra safe travels for Peyton, flying from Florida back to Michigan on Wednesday. Okay. And, um, boy dog. Um, Christine Mahalar, and Mahalar. Okay, dog passed away. Finally clicked. I'm sorry. To oh, and it's like losing. It is losing part of your family. Dog. So we'll keep them in our prayers. Um. On my side, just please keep my granddaughter, Ariana, those of you that were here a few years ago met her. She's a little high strung. Um, and they're moving, they're in the process of moving from Illinois. Her grandparents and her dad and her aunt are all going to move out to Texas where her mother's grandmother's family is. Ariana has lived in this house since she was six. She's 22. She's having a very difficult time of it because in her mind, she's not sure she'll remember mom when she's out of the house that a lot of time was spent there with her mom and um, her growing up. So please keep her in your prayers for the next few weeks as they make decisions and um, everything that's gone involved with that. So if you will all join me in prayer a moment. Dear Heavenly Holy Parent, we come before you today a small but mighty group. We know that wherever one or two are gathered in your name, two or three, that you are here with us. And I added the one, Lord, because you're always with us. And Lord, I pray right now that you will touch each life that is here represented. Even though all of us aren't physically here, we know that our people that can't come on a regular basis are with us in spirit and watching us. And we just pray, Lord, that you will touch their lives. Lord. Be with each one that is here too, Lord, as they go about their daily work. Sometimes it's harder than others to remember what we need to be focused on and stay focused on it. And we ask for your guidance in that. Lord, we ask that you will comfort those that are needing comfort from Mahala and her dog and, and the whole family there. A dog is part of, a, of us that you gave us. A cat in my case. They are our family. And it hurts really bad no matter what they say. And Lord, I just pray that you will be with others in the congregation that suffered loss this week that you will comfort them in their time of need, that you will help them to give comfort to others that are suffering with you. And Lord, we pray for all the traveling that's going on this week from Michigan to Florida, California, wherever the travels are going, Lord. We just pray that you will give them safely there and safely back or back to where they came from, Lord. We just pray that you will watch over all of them. Lord, please be with St. Paul's. Our spirit is right and our heart is right, and we want to grow and help this community. And Lord, we are asking you to show us the way. And Lord, be with my family in Illinois and help them to be able to make this transition as easy as possible and give them strength to make it through it. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and for those things that are just too too personal 
To say out loud, Lord, we pray right now in silence. And now, Lord, we offer up to you the prayer your Son taught us. Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us sing our communion hymn. come now to that special time in our life together as a community in worship, as we do each week when we come to this table as invited guests. As we do each week when we gather here, we remember that it was at the very end of his life that Jesus was sharing a meal with his disciples and friends. And during that meal, he took some bread from the table. He broke it and gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken and given for you. As often as you eat of this bread, do this in remembrance of me. In a similar manner, after their meal, he took a cup from the table. He blessed it and he gave it to them to drink and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this cup, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God given for we, the people of God. Let us partake and be renewed.
us stand and sing our closing hymn. Let us go forth, forth from this place with love in our hearts, empowered by the bread and the cup that we have received. Let us go in peace and serve the Lord. And now let us sing, Let There Be Peace on Earth.
Have a good week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.